The ship's mast groans under the weight of the open sails. A light wind moves the boat towards new horizons, new hope, and the new world. When Columbus discovered America, the world changed forever. At the end of the 15th century, European colonization of unknown inviting land, storing precious treasures, unexplored secrets, and great danger began. Some of you know how difficult it is to build a camp for several people on an expedition. You spend a lot of time setting up tents, making bonfires, gathering firewood, and cooking. Now imagine how difficult it is to create a large colony and build a city. And what about the country? You have no connection to the continent, the internet, or modern technology. You obtain food supplies and building materials on the island through hard work or wait for several months until a large ship reaches you. And there's no guarantee that it will come. It can get caught in a storm, go off course, or disappear mysteriously. Europeans were living in such conditions for centuries when they were colonizing the New World and building the United States of America. In addition to the obvious risks and dangers, they faced something sinister and unknown. For example, there were cases when entire colonies disappeared without a trace, and no one knew what happened to them. Perhaps they awakened something evil and inexplicable, or got lost in the forests of early America, or something much worse. One such case occurred with the Roanoke colony at the end of the 16th century. So far, none of the scientists and researchers have solved the mystery of the tragic disappearance of about a hundred people. In 1587, a group of settlers consisting of 115 people, with John White as their leader, was rapidly approaching the shores of America on a large cargo ship. John stared forward confidently. He was determined to establish a new territory for his country and build a house for his family. Besides experienced sailors, travelers, and builders on board the ship, there was John White's wife and his daughter with her husband. They all sailed to an island called Roanoke. This piece of land was a fort and, in the future, would be the beginning of modern North Carolina. However, John White didn't know yet at what price it would be done. The group leader was confident in his abilities because this was not the first attempt to establish a colony there. The first two times the British tried to build a fort post on the island ended with a series of failures. A lack of food supplies and other problems prevented colonization. But not everything was so bad. The previous settlers learned that there were precious metals somewhere on the island, and anyone who found them would become wealthy. Everything was supposed to work out this time. John White was sure of it and was prepared for the new attempt. So at last, the ship docked to the shore. The whole crew got to the ground. Everyone was excited about new opportunities on the new land, so they quickly started building a new home. John White supervised the construction, explored the island, and established contacts with the natives. The settlers spent every day working hard, building houses, making fires, and cooking food. And despite the difficult conditions, the team settled in, and John White's daughter gave birth to a daughter. However, soon, the standards of living began to deteriorate. Cold weather was approaching, and the supplies of food and building materials were quickly running out. Remembering the experience of the previous settlers, John White decided not to bring the situation to a critical point, so he went to England to get provisions in advance. He calculated that he could return before people ran out of supplies, so he left his wife, daughter, and granddaughter in Roanoke. He set off on a month-long journey back to England with a small team. Always keeping in mind that his family was waiting for him on the island, he came to the residence of Queen Elizabeth I immediately upon arrival to ask for a new cargo of food. However, while he was sailing to England, some events happened that interfered with his plans. His country came into conflict with Spain. The Queen ordered the return of all ships sailing for the New World. She decided to gather a fleet to fight the opponent. The shipment of provisions to the island where John White's family lived was cancelled. It's not known how the group leader reacted to these events, but he probably went crazy because of his inability to fix anything. Using all his connections and influence, John White managed to get a ship with provisions. However, it happened only three years after his return to England. He understood that the settler supplies had most likely run out by this time, 
and he had no idea what had happened to his family. With a new team, he quickly set off for the new world. A few months later, he saw the familiar outlines of the shore. The closer the ship got to the land, the more John White's excitement grew. He looked through a spyglass, but saw no signs of life on the island. When he came ashore, he immediately ran towards the settlement. He found houses they had built together destroyed. All trunks were looted. There was an ominous silence and no people. The colony seemed to have disappeared. John White realized something bad had happened to his people and his family. Perhaps they went somewhere in search of food supplies. Or maybe someone or something made them run away. England started several investigations to find out what had happened, but didn't get any answers. The only clue John White found was the word Croatoan scratched into a wooden post. For centuries, historians have been trying to unravel the disappearance of the colony. They put forward different versions. Some believed that the local tribes had attacked the colony, and others thought the settlers had gone inland in search of food and had just gotten lost. There was also a version that local tribes had put a curse on people and they had faced some phantom sinister force. However, the first version seemed the most realistic because Croatoan meant the name of the island where the tribes lived. Perhaps they waited until John White left the settlement and attacked the British. Of course, this version was also tested. People visited the island but found no traces of settlers there. And locals said they hadn't seen the disappeared colony. According to another version, the settlers tried to return to England after waiting for John White for some time. They were unsure whether the leader would come back, so they decided not to wait for the supplies to finish and went to England on the ships of other settlers sailing there. Who knows, maybe they got into a storm and disappeared at sea. Perhaps they met Spaniards with whom the British had a conflict. But all these are guesses that have no evidence. We would have never known what happened to the Roanoke colony if, in 2012, Elizabethan era researchers hadn't discovered the mark of an unknown fort drawn in invisible ink on John White's map. That place was only 50 miles from Roanoke. After discovering the new clue, archaeologists traveled to North Carolina to find a secret fort. They arrived at the place and found many fragments of English pottery lying on the ground. Among them, there were pots and jars for storing and cooking food. There was also a Native American village not far from this location. There's a version that the colony split up. One group went to the island of Croatoan to wait for John White. Before that, they scratched this word on a tree as a hint. The second group went deep into the country and settled in that secret place marked on the map. In the future, researchers may find definite answers to all these questions. But until that happens, the disappearance of the Roanoke colony is still one of the most famous mysteries in American history. Here's a random thought. Try to imagine the animals that could become the new top species should humans go extinct, that is. <laughs> Tricky, right? I mean, we are pretty cool with our high intelligence, fashion sense, ability to cook, and smartphones even if we forget the password sometimes. But if we suddenly disappeared, what animals might evolve to develop our skills and build complex societies like we have? Or would they come up with something better? Scientists have some ideas, thanks to modern gene sequencing technology and our understanding of evolution. We know that the climate on the planet will continue to change, so many species will need to adapt to survive. Convergence which is when two unrelated organisms end up developing similar traits to succeed in a particular environment or fill a niche, will also play a big role. For example, fish are perfected for life in water with their torpedo-like bodies and fins. But dolphins have evolved a very similar body, even though they're warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals with a completely different evolutionary background. So, maybe some animals could develop hands similar to ours to fill the same role as humans, like building cities and modifying the environment. Primates like chimpanzees and bonobos are already close to that with their opposable thumbs, which they use to make tools in the wild. It's also possible that birds, the only surviving dinosaurs, could become the new smartest animals if humans suddenly disappear. Birds are incredibly brainy and can flock together in large groups. 
Some, such as sociable weavers, even build communal nesting sites, though they may not look like human metropolises. And let's not forget octopuses, which are probably the smartest non-human animals on Earth. They can learn to distinguish between real and virtual objects and engineer their environment. However, adapting to life on land might be tricky for them. You see, there's a lot we don't know about animal intelligence. And let's be honest, we humans have been quite arrogant about it throughout history. In the past, people used to think that animal intelligence could be neatly organized into a hierarchy, with humans at the top and insects at the bottom. But in the 1960s, a new generation of researchers challenged this idea and suggested that intelligence should be measured in relative rather than absolute terms. As technology has improved, we've been able to see animals for longer without disturbing them, and we've discovered they are far more intelligent than we once thought. For example, researchers in Melbourne are using remote-controlled drones to study the breeding patterns of southern right whales, and artificial intelligence is helping us track and predict the movements of all sorts of creatures. It's funny how we tend to recognize intelligence in animals when their behavior is similar to our own. Dolphins, for example, use names and even have accents. In fact, researchers have found that dolphins in southern Brazil have developed a distinct accent after interacting with local fishers for over 100 years. But it's not just mammals that are intelligent. Birds and insects are pretty smart, too. Parrots, for example, have complex social groups and can differentiate between members of their species based on their relationships with each other. And even though their brains are tiny, like mine, insects are capable of some pretty impressive cognitive feats, like tool use and learning by observation. We used to think that intelligence was unique to humans and maybe a few other primates, but now we know that's not the case. In fact, research has shown that intelligence is distributed in different ways across the animal kingdom. Some animals excel in one area, but may not be as good in another. It's all about the environmental pressures that each species faces and how they adapt to them. We all know about the usual suspects when it comes to high intelligence in the animal kingdom. Chimps, dogs, dolphins, blah blah blah. But there are some unexpected additions to the list that might surprise you. And you might even have one of them napping in your lap right now. I'm talking about our feline friends, house cats. They're renowned masters of getting treats and avoiding baths. But did you know they're also pretty smart? Cats have an amazing ability to learn from observation and repetition, which is why we've coined the term copycats. And some cats, like the one in this next story named Nora, take it to the next level. Nora's owner spends her days teaching kids to play piano, and this cat was getting a little jealous of all the attention they were receiving. So what did she do? She watched them closely, picked up on their movements, and started tapping away at the keys herself. And you know what? It worked. Nora's owner and the kids were amazed, and Nora became a little bit of a piano sensation. She even sits at the piano like a proper piano student. Just because she doesn't have opposable thumbs doesn't mean she can't be a musical prodigy. But wider paws would help to hit those octaves. The next story is about rats. Now don't jump on the couch in fear just yet. And before you go calling them pests, did you know that some rats are actually helping save lives? Researchers in Africa have been training these furry little detectives to sniff out lung disease in saliva samples. And they're really good at it, too. These rats have a nose for the job and can detect different scents that are needed to show whether a sample contains a certain bacterium or not. Now, you might be wondering why rats were chosen for this important job. It's because they're super smart and quick learners. These rats go through a series of training exercises to learn how to sniff out different samples. They then alert their trainers to which samples hold bacteria. And get this, they can do it in just 7 minutes a task that would take a human scientist a full day of testing, these rats can do in a fraction of the time. Dr. Rat. Now, ever heard of Nellie the pig? She's surely not your average swine. This clever piggy has proved that animal intelligence goes way beyond just performing tricks. Nellie was presented with a series of challenges, including putting differently shaped items through a hoop. Now, while she was being taught to put round objects through a round hoop, Nellie decided to take it to the next level. When presented with objects that weren't round, she compared their shape with a hoop before deciding they wouldn't fit. 
this pig has some serious problem-solving skills. It's fascinating to see how pig brains process spatial awareness and solve different tasks. Who knew these curly-tailed creatures were such smarty pants? Now, elephants are probably some of the most amazing animals on Earth, not just because of their looks. They are not only cute, but they're also super smart and empathetic. These gentle giants are known for their incredible cooperation and coordination skills, which they use to protect their families and scare away their enemies. In the wild, elephants travel in clans and communicate with each other using low-frequency rumbles. They work together to keep their young ones safe from predators, and they're not afraid to show their dominance by kidnapping calves from competing clans. Researchers have found out that elephants are quick learners and can work together to achieve a common goal. They even show empathy toward each other, which is a pretty rare feature in the animal kingdom. For instance, elephants have a special interest in the remains of their own kind. They'll linger near elephant bones and investigate sticks of ivory much longer than they would pieces of wood. Also, when an elephant is feeling upset, other elephants will come to comfort it by stroking its head with their trunks or even putting their trunk in its mouth. Now, how sweet is that? In 2010, one elephant in particular really impressed scientists with his skills. He was seen eyeing some tasty fruit just out of his trunk's reach. After pondering for a few days, he had his aha moment. He discovered a large plastic block and used it as a stepping stool to reach the fruit. He continued to use his newfound tool skills to reach even higher places, stacking blocks to get his favorite treat. Now, by this time, you've surely heard about strange phenomena happening in the Bermuda Triangle, like strong waves or even a vortex from time to time. But there's another territory equally as mysterious, only this time it's on land. It's called the Bennington Triangle. Some have argued that there must be some inexplicable force wreaking havoc here in this region, responsible for disappearances and unexplained phenomena. This location is also connected to Native American folklore, which further adds to its mystery. For some events, there are perfectly rational explanations. For others, we've yet to find out the truth. But let's start looking at this region's history. The unusual triangle is located in southwestern Vermont in the United States. Before any weird occurrences took place here, the area was occupied by the Abenaki tribe, first discovered in the 1600s. They were indigenous people that we know have lived throughout portions of Canada and the U.S. Their beliefs were strongly connected to the local weather. The Abenaki people thought one of their major spirits, named Tabuldak, lived on the peak of the Glassbury Mountain. Since the winds here tend to be pretty fussy, these tribespeople believe Tabuldak created a dangerous creature made out of rocks on these peaks, meant to scare people away. Years later, in the 1700s, this region became the location for a town called Glastonbury. It reached its peak popularity in the 19th century. But even then, the population never exceeded 250 people. These days, it is nothing more than a ghost town with only four families living here in 2000. Sure, on one hand, the town was flooded in its entirety at one point, so this may be a reason why people chose to leave the area. But there is more. To this day, many felonies that happened here have yet to be solved. One story speaks of a man that attacked a co-worker, claiming he heard voices telling him to do so. Another one tells the story of a man that eventually lost his life after going hunting despite no one being around him at the time, not even wildlife. Then there's the legend of a local wild man who was known to scare people in the towns of Bennington and Glastonbury. Nobody knew who he was or where he came from. He just appeared every once in a while, dressed in a black coat, terrorizing people using various devices, and then retreated to the forest. Today, the Bennington Triangle is mostly known for six unusual disappearances. They all happened between the years 1945 and 1950, soon after the town of Glastonbury was removed from official records by the state of Vermont. The first disappearance was that of Carl Herrick. He was out hunting with his cousin near Glastonbury Mountain. He was never found by local rescuers. Then there was another reported disappearance, that of an experienced hunter and hiker named Middle Rivers. Local authorities have no idea to this day what might have happened in this case. A college student named Paula Weldon 
soon had the same fate. Probably the most famous disappearance is that of James Tedford. He was last seen on a bus full of people. Witnesses from that day don't even remember him exiting the vehicle. Paul Jepson is also known to have vanished from this area. He was working on his family farm when he disappeared without a trace. His relatives recounted him telling them he was headed to Glassbury Mountain Forest before it happened. Ooh, spooky. Is there any connection between these events? Locals believe so, and weirdly enough, it has to do with the color red. Since at least two of the people that went missing here were last seen wearing this color, it became a local legend. People traveling through this area avoid wearing red to this day, in hopes they avoid whatever creature or natural phenomena might be targeting this color. Timing may have something to do with it too. Most of the people that were lost here were last seen late in the afternoon, between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Bottom line, the most reasonable explanation behind the legend of the Bennington Triangle is its unusual weather. Even Native Americans that used to roam these areas thought that on top of the mountain was a meeting point of four winds, bound to eternally struggle with each other. Turns out there is some truth to this myth, as the wind direction on the mountain is unstable, making plants grow at strange angles. These conditions are known to often confuse even the most experienced hikers. The forest here is also wildly dense and filled with dangerous animals. Places like Bermuda or Bennington Triangle became famous for their mysterious disappearances, which may have some reasonable explanation behind them. But a whole train going missing? Back in 1911, a regular train was supposed to leave from a railway station in Rome, Italy. It was meant to reach the city of Milan. Surprisingly, none of the 106 passengers ever made it to the destination, and they were also never seen again. You can't help but wonder, were they really lost forever? Weirdly enough, it may not be the case based on some local folklore. As it was completing its journey, the train was supposed to pass through a long tunnel. It did enter it, but nothing ever came out the other end of the tunnel. Nothing was left of the train, and it seemed like it simply just vanished into thin air. Out of all the people on board, a mere two were found, but they were quite unwell at the time they were discovered. Also, the story they told did not seem to make much sense. They remembered a dense fog that took over the entirety of the train. To escape, they jumped out of the windows because they got so scared. Fifteen years later, a story emerged about a group of 104 Italian people that appeared all of a sudden in Mexico City, claiming they arrived by train from Rome. Now, if that's not weird enough, this story appears to have been reported back in 1845 which was 66 years before the train had even departed in the first place. Turns out this whole story was nothing but a local urban legend that originated in a piece of literature. But it did get an amazing amount of popularity. Speaking of the Bermuda Triangle, I was, wasn't I? Yes, I was. It's not the only place on Earth where ships go missing. It's just the most popular. Whenever a ship happens to sink, you'd expect at least to find pieces of it on the bottom of the sea, right? Well, not if you're traveling through Lake Superior, located along the border of the United States and Canada. This one gained popularity due to a large number of ships that went missing while sailing it. It may have something to do with the stormy winds, similar to what happens in the Bennington Triangle. Of course, that doesn't explain why some ships simply vanish altogether, without a single piece of them ever to be found not even at the bottom of the lake. It does gather a lot of tourists each year, though, looking to scuba dive and see the remains of some of the ships that still lie here. The bottom of this lake even contains what's left of the famous SS Edmund Fitzgerald. Back when it departed on June 7, 1958, it was the largest ship on North America's Great Lakes. And to this day, it's still the largest ship ever to have sunk in the area. Why this ship sank in the first place is yet another mystery. Yosemite National Park is one of the most popular natural resorts in the world, but it does hide dark secrets of its own. Despite its beauty and abundance of wildlife, a total of 45 people went missing right here in this location and were never found again. There are even stories of people that disappeared from one area of the park only to be stumbled upon in a completely different location, with some of their clothes missing, no less. 
This hasn't stopped the over 3 million people from visiting the park each year. But many of them do dress in layers. Welcome to No, a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like Nome. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons. But it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. There are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Nome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. For a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. 
The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Polides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. He found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire, but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. Everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened? Now, if you're in an airplane soaring through the air, you may think it's the heaviest object in the sky. But those large cumulus clouds you see shaped like your dog can weigh more than a million pounds. Clouds are just tiny drops of water gathered up together. Yeah, don't worry, they won't come crashing down in pieces. It may seem like there are infinite stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but NASA experts are convinced that there are potentially 100 to 400 billion stars out there. There are around 3 trillion trees in the world and about 400,000 plant species. Out of all those plants, between 80,000 and 300,000 are edible. But only about 200 of those plants land in different cuisines. If you're standing in Alaska, you can expect Hawaii to inch its way to you ever so slowly. You might not feel it, but tectonic plates are always moving at the same rate as your fingernails are growing. 
Hawaii moves 3 inches every year because the Pacific Plate is always pushing northward. Bees buzz around with four wings instead of two. The two wings you usually see become a single wing when they fly. But when they land and chill around, they unhook back to four wings. They even have an invisible chain network where they fly through to go from flower to flower. Bees can fly higher than Mount Everest, which is almost 30,000 feet high. Hurricanes can't rush across the equator because of something called the Coriolis effect, which is also responsible for many megastorms. Low pressures in the northern hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, it goes clockwise. So if a hurricane swings by the equator, it won't be able to rotate. The acid inside your stomach is so strong, it can melt stainless steel. The acid inside is rocking a pH of 2 to 3 and doesn't melt your insides thanks to a stomach lining which secretes a chemical to balance it out. Your body replaces this lining every 4 days or so. Owls have something like eye tubes instead of eyeballs. Humans can turn their heads at a 180-degree angle and can rotate their eyes in multiple directions. Owls don't move their eyes freely like us, but they make up for it by turning their heads 270 degrees. They can see really well at night. Okay, chameleon, we get it. You can move your eyes independently in all directions. Please stop staring at me. If you happen to be in outer space on a planet in our solar system, then chances are you're swimming in diamonds. The atmospheres of planets like Jupiter and Saturn have high pressures that can crystallize carbon atoms and create diamonds. Scientists even claim that all that icy bling rains as much as 2 million pounds yearly in Saturn. The sun will keep getting brighter and hotter and eventually evaporate oceans, making life on Earth like an oven similar to Venus. Our Milky Way is on its course to a collision with the Andromeda Galaxy. Stars, asteroids, planets, and moons will smash right into each other and destroy everything. Of course, something like this doesn't happen overnight, but eventually, the two galaxies will combine into a single mega-cluster galaxy. This won't happen for billions of years, though. I won't be around that. Slow lorises with their bugged eyes may be cute, but they're the only venomous primates in the animal kingdom. They get venom from a gland under their armpit before biting a predator. Unfortunately, their numbers are dwindling in the wild. Forests and jungles aren't the only ones responsible for producing the majority of the oxygen you breathe. It's the microscopic creatures called photoplankton that live in the upper layers of water, specifically the oceans. Like plants, they also use photosynthesis to turn sunlight into oxygen. There are so many of them that they contribute 50-85% to of all the oxygen. Pluto was discovered in 1930 and, until now, hasn't even made a full rotation around the Sun. It takes Pluto 248 years to make a full orbit, which means Pluto will celebrate with fireworks and countdowns in the year 2178. There have been instances where snow was covering the sandy landscapes of the Sahara Desert. And it isn't even the largest desert on Earth. The winner in that category goes to the Antarctic polar desert. Instead of sand, it's made of frozen water. Even the Sahara receives more rainfall than the Antarctic desert. In 1933, the Double Eagle was a coin valued at $20. Only a few of these were released, but the trend never picked up, and so the coin was reclaimed. Some were kept, but most were destroyed. In 2002, someone bought one of these coins at an auction for $7.5 million, making it the most expensive coin ever sold at an auction. Kangaroos have a spring-like action on their legs, which makes them hop around. But it's impossible for them to do so without their tails, that act as a counterweight. These hoppers can bounce at a speed of around 15 miles per hour. And kangaroos can't hop backwards. Your favorite summer snack was invented by accident by an 11-year-old boy in 1905. Frank Epperson accidentally left soda powder and water with a wooden stick overnight and got frozen stiff. He called it the Epps cycle at first, but popsicles stuck around and now they come in many awesome flavors. The biggest animal on Earth weighs as much as 33 elephants. Its tongue alone can be as heavy as one of those elephants. A blue whale's heart can weigh as much as a small car and needs to beat every 10 seconds. Three big blue whales stacked head to fin are about the length of the Statue of Liberty. A human can even swim through their large veins with ease. The nano-chameleon is the tiniest reptile to be discovered. In January 2021, 
scientists went on an expedition in northern Madagascar rainforests and found this little critter. It feeds on mites and other microscopic creatures and is a little more than half an inch long. Europa is one of Jupiter's many moons and is the closest thing scientists call our next potential home within our solar system. The surface is covered in ice, but it's believed there's an ocean underneath that that could be teeming with microscopic living beings. If you're afraid of the dark, then the moon is probably no place for you. Shadows are darker on the moon than on Earth. On our blue planet, the atmosphere is able to scatter more sunlight, unlike on the moon. The people of ancient Greece and Rome used sticky spider webs as natural bandages for patients. The webbings have built-in natural chemicals that help with healing. Spider webs are so strong that 2 inches of wrapped spider web material can stop a plane when at landing speed. A study shows that tree shrews have a mutation in their system that makes them less sensitive to spices. They're the only known mammal other than humans to enjoy the flavors of mouth-burning chili foods. They did an experiment with a bunch of other mammals and found out that while the mammals avoided the spicy food, the tree shrews gobbled it down without thinking. Dolphins are one of the smartest creatures in the world, partly because they can sleep while being awake. When sleeping in the wild, their brains have to be partially on guard for any predators lurking in the water. When the heat rises in a fire, the air around it rushes to replace it, causing a spinning column to form. And that's how fire tornadoes or fire whirls are born. Octopuses may be rare to spot since they camouflage themselves so well, but they can lay more than 55,000 eggs. The mother will spend the next six months taking care of them, and once they hatch, they can be the size of a single rice grain. Next time you're cuddling with your cat, check out their back paws and count how many toes they have. There are five toes on each of their forepaws, but only four on their hind paws. Scientists believe it helps them run faster or escape after plotting against you. <laughs> Chow Chows and some other dog breeds have bluish-purple tongues. Giraffes also have tongues of a similar color, except theirs are around 20 inches long. They use them for grabbing leaves from high branches. Next time you visit the Eiffel Tower, take a picture in the summer and the winter. If you have super bionic eyesight, then you'll notice that in the summer, the higher temperatures can make the tower grow by 6 inches. Hey, any view of the Eiffel is an eyeful. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village and, at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it, with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. Usually, there are many people here, 
but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here. And dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from fear. After going around the entire settlement, he finds not a single soul. Terrified, he leaves the village, heads for the nearest telegraph pole, and sends a message to the police. After a while, more and more people arrive. The police are trying to find traces of missing people and figure out what has happened. But there's nothing. Near the village, they find an empty grave. During the ceremony, the Inuits placed stones around the burial site. The rocks around the open pit lie untouched, which means it wasn't an animal that dug it up. But who or what needed it? About 30 people lived in the village, and they're all gone. Local residents from neighboring villages can't help, since they have no idea what has happened. The only thing that the police have noticed is unusual blue lights. In this area, the northern lights are a common phenomenon. People living here regularly see a glow in the starry sky. But the police have seen something else, pulsing blue lights. Also, other hunters have witnessed something similar. They say that some strange things were flying in the sky. This all happened in 1930. It's been almost 90 years since the disappearance of the village, and people have created a bunch of theories. The most popular of them is an attack of an extraterrestrial civilization. According to this theory, the blue lights in the sky that the locals and the police saw were spaceships. Some believe that one ominous night, these ships flew to the settlement and took away all the people. In addition to these sci-fi versions, there were also more realistic ones. Internet users have found out that Joe LaBelle didn't have a hunting license. Maybe he wasn't a professional and made it all up. But at that time, many hunters didn't have a license, so Joe's words may be true. But if we try to find out where all this information came from, we'll see that the primary sources were books and some newspaper articles from the 30s. But none of them can confirm that the mysterious story of Lake Anjakuni is true. Perhaps this entire story was made up. Now let's leave the snows of Canada and head for the hot plains of India. In this big country, there's one sinister village where people also disappeared without a trace. This happened in the first half of the 19th century. Still, locals avoid this place even now because they believe that invisible evil forces live there. Let's check and find out what happened to the village of Kuldara. It's located in the district of Rajasthan. To get there, you can use a taxi to get to the nearest village or city. The village is located far from other settlements. It looks deserted. There are only ruins. It looks like archaeologists have recently dug this place out of the ground and left it here. But this is not an ancient city. The village was abandoned more than 200 years ago. But up to that point, this place had been thriving. Kuldara was a large village. Local people were mostly farmers. They sold their agricultural products. And then, one night, everything changed. People abandoned their homes and stuff and ran away from there. No one knows why they did it, and no one knows where they went. Nobody has ever seen the inhabitants of Kuldara again. Apart from tourists, almost no one comes here. The locals are sure that the village is cursed and is the center of paranormal activity. If you ask residents of other nearby towns or read the information on the internet, you'll learn a couple of legends about this place. One popular version says that people left this village because of a lack of water. However, this version doesn't explain why the residents did it overnight. 
and left their things behind. According to another version, the villagers ran away to save the daughter of the Kuldara chief. One local ruler fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. He threatened the locals with grave consequences if the girl rejected him. The ruler gave them one day to make a decision. The residents disagreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village together with the chief and his daughter. But if this is true, why did no one else see these people? They must have escaped to another settlement. In addition, they needed their things on the way there. The stories of Kuldara and Lake Anjakuni have one thing in common. People left a comfortable and safe place for an unknown reason. A similar story happened in Ireland with a small village on the island of Ackle. About 40 simple houses made of stone and straw were located along the valley of Keem Bay. The village was mentioned in documents dated back to the 1830s as a group of small buildings. But today, there's practically nothing left of it except pieces of walls and small mounds of ground. People from other settlements don't remember this village, but we know about it thanks to the records of travel writers. They describe the incredible beauty of this place and the village in their diaries. Students of the local archaeological school tried to find the answers. They started excavations and discovered that the villagers could have left the village because of hunger or 